Good morning. How are you today? I hope you are doing well. Do you have your guided student notes printed out? Are you ready to follow along? Today's lesson, we are talking about volume. What's the difference between volume and area? Well, volume describes a three-dimensional space. So in your guided student notes, that first blank that you have, volume describes the amount of space that something occupies. When we are discussing volume, we use cubed units. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that we don't end up uh, using sloppy language and mixing up terminology for area and volume. You can fill a volume of a container. You can move a volume of air through a duct. You can compress a volume of gas in a cylinder. But there's no such thing as the volume of a rectangle. And you certainly couldn't measure volume with a tape measure because rulers measure length. An object that has a rectangular base and vertical sides is sometimes called a rectangular solid. But that's just uh, kind of a layman's name for it. It's not always something solid and it's uh, sort of sloppy language. The proper name for this is rectangular prism. So rectangular prism is three-dimensional and has volume. When we talk about volume, we often use cubed units. So, for example, you might see cubic feet. So that's written as feet with an exponent of three feet cubed. You also might see some cubic meters, otherwise written as meters cubed. Perhaps cubic miles, written as miles cubed. Remember, like before, be careful with your abbreviations. M is for meters, MI is for miles. If you use M for miles, then somebody is going to get mixed up. We have cubic inches, inches cubed, and we have cubic centimeters that are centimeters cubed. So the first question is, what is a cubic foot? And a cubic foot, well, it's a cube, and each of the sides measure one foot. So on your guided student notes, you have a picture of a cube. It's labeled as one cubic foot, and it's probably not a bad idea for you to go through and label the length and the width and the height as one foot each. The next picture you have looks something like this, one centimeter on each side of the cube. And of course that's called a cubic centimeter. After that, you have a picture of a cube measuring one meter on each side. And of course that is a cubic meter. There are a few volume formulas that you should know. We use these a lot. Worth your time to commit them to memory. The first is the volume of a rectangular prism, right? This box. We have the length, we have the depth, and we have the height. Some people say length and width and height. Some people say, I don't know, width and depth and height. It doesn't matter. We are just multiplying all three dimensions. So in this picture, maybe the length is here. Uh, the depth is the distance from front to back, and of course the height goes up and down. You of course know that all sorts of boxes can have different orientations and maybe nothing is horizontal and nothing is vertical. It really doesn't matter. We're just multiplying all three dimensions together. When we talk about a cube, well a cube is just a special type of rectangular prism. It's still a box. We need to multiply all three dimensions together. The special thing about a cube, of course, is that all three dimensions are exactly the same. So the formula looks a little bit different. The volume of a cube is x times x times x, which we know is x cubed. And x represents the side length. So the appearance of the formula has changed but the idea hasn't. If it's a box, we multiply all three dimensions together. Cylinders are a little different. The volume of a cylinder is given by the formula pi times the radius squared, you'll recognize that from the area of a circle, times the height. Now, we don't want to get all caught up in the idea of height being something that is up and down. Pi r squared, that's the radius of the circle. Pi r squared talks about the area of the circle. 
we're here talking about the area of this base. The height is the other dimension. So what we really want to think about is that this is the area of the circular base multiplied by the other dimension. Um, this might be the height. This might be the length. However it is that you think about it. But we want to get three dimensions here, right? The area of the base, and then we want to go the other way. If we turned this cylinder around, right, h would still be right there. And of course, our radius is right there. So height is not always an up and down thing. It's just one dimension of this cylinder. OK, let's move on and try a few examples. Units of volume are cubed because that's what happens when we multiply the three dimensions together. So if we wanted to find the volume of this box, we have 7 inches in one direction, 4 inches, maybe you would call that the height, and 3 inches, probably you call this the depth. And we know that the volume is the product of all three dimensions, the length times the depth times the height. So the first thing we want to do is just write that down. 7 inches times 3 inches times 4 inches. And we know that we can move these things around. We can multiply all of the constants together and then multiply all of the units together. 7 times 3 times 4 gives us 84. Inches times inches times inches will give us cubic inches, inches cubed. So now here on our box, we have some grid lines, and we can see the three-dimensional cubes that are filling up this space. If we pull one of them away, this would be a cube that measures one inch on each side. And so, of course, it would be a cubic inch. And this box can be filled up with 84 of those cubes. And that's why the volume is 84 cubic inches. Every trade has its uh, commonly used language that may or may not be as uh, math specific as I would like. When you are talking about a rectangular volume or the volume of a rectangular room, um, we really want to understand that rectangles don't have volumes, they have areas. What we're really talking about is a space that has a rectangular base and vertical sides. And so we get this rectangular prism that we had before. just like we had, um, say, rectangular duct before, right? A duct is a three-dimensional thing, and we're just talking about the shape of the opening. All right, let's try another example. We have a basement, 45 feet long and 30 feet wide. The walls are 8 feet tall. What is the volume of the basement? So let's start by labeling our picture. We have 45 feet here, uh, 30 feet in this direction, and eight feet tall on the walls. Clearly this is not drawn to scale, but that's okay. So for the volume of the basement, we would need to multiply the length times the width times the height. Right? So don't get caught up on the fact that the one of these now says width instead of depth. The idea is that we need to multiply all three dimensions together. But writing the formula down every time you work is a good way to make sure that you will remember it later on. Just like when you were a little kid and you were trying to remember how to spell your spelling words, you may have written them over and over and over again. It's the same way when we're trying to learn how to memorize formulas. All right, so we have length times width times height. Let's fill in the pieces that we know. 45 feet times 30 feet times 8 feet, and we just multiply. So 45 times 30 times 8, is 720. Wait a minute, that doesn't quite seem right. Let me double check that. Ah, it is not 720. It is 10,800. So let's fix that here. Who knows how that got on this slide. Not 720. Hang on. 
Not 720, but uh, 10,800. But the units are still cubic feet. Now, right about now, you're probably wondering, how come she just didn't scrap this whole lesson and start over? Why leave a mistake on there? Um, and I thought about it. But quite honestly, this is a good time to bring up that idea that we talked about before with mental estimation. Clearly, I changed a number somewhere and didn't update the rest of the problem. But I had a good sense about what the answer should be in the first place. Comes in handy sometimes. All right. So the volume is 10,800 cubic feet. I think there's a little more to this question. Ah, yes. To be classified as an unconfined space, the basement needs at least 50 cubic feet of space for every 1,000 BTUs per hour produced. What is the maximum number of BTUs that can be produced in this basement and still keep it classified as an unconfined space? Wow, okay, that's kind of long. So the first thing we need to know or think about is here. At least 50 cubic feet of space for every 1,000 BTUs per hour produced. So the first thing we need to know is how many 50s are in 10,800. And that is a straight division problem. So we take 10,800 and divide by 50. And clearly I'm going to have to use my calculator here because whatever answer I had before is not going to work. Uh -huh. And this comes up to be 216. All right, and each of these 216 pieces that have a volume of 50 cubic feet allows us 1,000 BTUs per hour from the appliances in our basement. So we will take this 216 and multiply by 1,000, which of course gives us 216,000. And these are BTUs per hour, because this is 50 cubic feet for every 1,000 BTUs per hour. So what does that mean for us? Well, the basement usually holds, what, the furnace, the water heater, other types of things that are producing BTUs per hour. So when you add all of their BTUs together from their labels, the most we can have in this particular basement is 216,000 BTUs as a total. All right, let's move on to our next space, or next example, sorry. The volume of a room is 800 cubic meters. The floor of the room is a rectangle with a length of 18 meters, the walls are two and a half meters tall. How wide is the basement? All right, so let's see. Um, the first thing we should do is maybe label our diagram. The walls are two and a half meters tall. The length is 18 meters. And we don't know this dimension over here, but we do know the volume. So to calculate the volume, we have to multiply all three dimensions together. So we need two and a half multiplied by 18, and also times this x. But I know the volume already, so I can fill that in where the v is. 800 is equal to 2 and a half times 18 times that unknown dimension. All right, so with our calculator, let's see what 2 and a half times 18 is. And that comes out to be 45. So 800 is equal to 45 times x. All right, well, now we're in a comfortable position. We know how to solve this equation. The 45 is being multiplied by the x. So all we have to do is divide both sides by 45. And if we divide this side by 45, 45 divided by 45 gives us 1 and leaves that x all by itself. And dividing by 45 on the other side. Now let's see what we have. 800 divided by 45. Oh, that's a nice long decimal. 17.777 dot 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 stuff. We're going to have to do a little bit of rounding. As we look at 
the dimensions that were given to us. One of them gives us something to the tenths place, so that's probably a good place to round to. It is the one that has the most decimal places in it. So we would say that the basement is about 17.8 meters wide. How did we know that we needed units of meters on this answer? Well, the volume came as meters cubed, and the other two dimensions were also in meters, and it's meters times meters times meters that gives us meters cubed. So the width of this basement needed to be in meters as well. Let's move on. Here we have a cube with a volume of 2,197 cubic centimeters, and we'd like to know its dimensions. Ha, huh, well, it's a cube. So we know that all of the dimensions are the same size. The volume of a cube is given by cubing each side length. And we know that the volume is 2,197. Make sure you put that where the V was, not where the X was. 2,197 is certainly not the side length. All right, well, we need to get rid of this cube here. What undoes a cube? That's right, a cubed root. So if we take the cube root of x cubed and the cube root of 2,197, what do we get? And you'll remember, of course, that a cube root undoes a cube. So this right-hand side is just x. For the left-hand side, we're going to use our calculator. Hang on, let me pull mine up so you can see it. There we go. It's been a little while since we've done cube roots on our calculator. So let's see. Um, this is not a square root, so don't use this little square root thing over here. We want to use the cube root, which is this one here that has the little x where the index is. Remember that the first thing we need is the index. We have to use the second button to access the stuff that is written on the calculator. So then we press the button right below where the labeling is. So now we have a cube root, it's starting to look good, of 2,197. And of course, enter is or equals. And we end up with an answer of 13. So this x is 13. 13 what? Well, the volume came in cubic centimeters, which means we need centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. The actual question here asks for the dimensions of the cube. And when we talk about uh, dimensions, we usually use the word by, which means multiplication. So we say 13 centimeters by 13 centimeters by 13 centimeters. Oops, centimeters, CM. Wow, looks like I need some coffee today, huh? All right, on to the next one. Soft copper tubing has an inner diameter of half of an inch. A section of tubing 52 inches long connects the evaporator and the compressor. We need to know how much refrigerant this length of tubing can hold. Well, all right, so what we need then is the inner volume. We're going to end up with the inner volume because we were talking here about the inner diameter. So we're not really worried about the thickness of the tubing itself. We're just looking at the inside. All right, do you remember your formula for the volume of a cylinder? If not, go back, look it up, pause the recording, write it down. All right, so here we go. The volume is equal to pi r squared, right, that gives us the area of the circular end, times h, which is the length or the height of the tubing. In this case, of course, it's the length. All right, let's see what we have. Um, volume is equal to pi. What's our radius? Hmm. Oh, well, we had a diameter. Let's keep this information over here. The diameter is 0 0.5, and the radius is half of that, 
0.25. So we want to make sure that we pay attention to the wording here so that we use the right values. 0.25. And of course that radius is squared. Uh, the height, well we don't know that, so we'll leave that alone. Oh yes we do. Gosh, I really do need some coffee. Hang on, let's erase that. Goodbye, height. Okay, the height, this length, is 52. There we go. So this is pretty much a straightforward calculator problem. Let me grab my calculator here real quick so we can remember where everything is at. So pi, pi is over here, fourth button down on the left, multiplied by the radius, 0 0.25 which is being squared, so we'll use our squared button. Also multiplied by the height, or the length in this case, which is 52. So you can enter this exactly the way that you see it. Your calculator can handle it all. And we come up with 10.21 uh, other stuff. So where should we round? Well, we're going to choose the uh, second decimal place because that's the way our radius came to us. So rounding to the hundredths place, we look to the right, we see the zero, and this will be 10.21. All right, so here we have the volume is about 10.21. 10.21 what? Well, this radius was in inches. When we squared the radius, we got square inches. The length, or the height, was 52 inches. So I have inches times inches times inches, which of course gives us cubic inches. All right, a couple more. We want to talk about density. So on this page in your guided student notes, you have a big blank, and density is the word that belongs in the blank. Density is sometimes called weight density, um, but the other types of densities that we have get used so infrequently that we just sort of leave off the word weight and call it density. And if we talk about something else, then we are more specific in the way we speak. At any rate, we use division to compare the weight of a substance to its volume. So for example, the density of water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And what that means is that one cubic foot of water weighs 62.4 pounds. If a substance has a density less than water, well, then it floats, like ice. Ice has a density of 57.5 pounds per cubic foot. If we want to calculate density, our guide is the units. Pounds per cubic foot means that we will divide the weight by the volume. All right, so let's try a nice long problem here. We have an aluminum rod with a radius of 0.03125 feet. And this has a volume of 0.039 cubic feet. And the first thing we want to know is how long is the aluminum rod? Okay, um, well, what do we have? We've got a lot of volume here. So let's bring up our formula for volume. Pi r squared, right, area of the circular end, times the height or the length of the rod. So that's the thing we don't know there. Okay, let's fill in everything we know. We have 0 0.039 for the volume. We have pi. We have a radius of 0 0.03125 squared. And we have a mystery dimension, the height. All right, well, this looks a little intimidating, but we are not gonna let that get to us. Let's see what sort of calculations we can do. As it turns out, I can't write on my slide and keep the calculator visible at the same time. So this calculator is going to disappear a couple of times. It might look a little strange, but hopefully it won't bother you too much. On the right-hand side of this equation here, we have pi times this radius squared. The first thing we want to do is calculate what that's worth. So pi times 0, 0.0, whoops. All right, so let's talk about how to fix this up because I missed part of it. 
we can delete things. 0 0.03125. And of course, we would like that to be squared. This value, with its many, many, many decimal places, of course, because pi is involved, is what is being multiplied by h. So if I were to write a new line over here, I would have 0 0.039 is equal to the answer from my calculator multiplied by h. And my goal is to get this h all by itself. So what I really want to do is divide both sides of my equation by this value on my calculator. All right, so I'm going to write this down uh, with a little uh, math language, and then we'll come back to the calculator here in just a second. All right, so now the calculator's gone. I'll bring it back in a minute. For right now, if I want to get h all by itself, I need to undo this multiplication, right? This value, that was what we had on our calculator, is being multiplied by h. And to undo the multiplication, I need to divide. So I will divide by pi and 0.03125 squared. And of course, what we do on one side, we have to do on the other. And when we get done with this, right, all this stuff in the box is going to cancel with what's in the denominator, and h is going to be left all alone. The problem, of course, is the really long decimal that we had on our calculator from this. We don't want to try to type it all in and maybe leave some decimal places behind. We'd like to use the full and complete answer from the calculator. So here's what we would do. On your calculator, Let's look at the left-hand side. The left-hand side says 0 0.039, and we would like to divide it by this number right up here. This number here is the last answer that we had before. And right above the negative key, you can see it says ANS. That stands for answer. So it's written in yellow, so we'll use our yellow key there, divided by second and answer. And that says use the last answer that we had. This way we don't lose any of those decimal places and rounding is not going to affect our results. So now, there we go. Let's see, how about uh, for right now, let's just take the um, tenths place. So about 12.7 and let's put that in our problem. So H is about 12.7. 12.7 what? Well, we had a volume of cubic feet. We had a radius that came in feet. This h is also talking about feet. So h is about 12.7 feet. All right, there's another part to this problem. This aluminum rod weighs about 6.67 pounds. We'd like to know its density. Remember that density has units of pounds per cubic foot. So really, we're just going to divide the weight by the volume. 6.67 pounds divided by the cubic feet that we had before, 0 0.039 cubic feet. You use your calculator, and we come up with just about 171 pounds per cubic foot. All right, so now we're going to ask a silly question. Will this rod float in water? And of course, you already know that it's not going to float in water because it's an aluminum rod and you've seen them sink before. But the reason why this is here is because we really want to compare the densities, 171 pounds per cubic foot is much greater than the density of water, which we know now is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. How does density matter to you? Well, just as things float or sink in water, things also float or sink in air. So we might have to worry about, say, propane collecting in low places because it sinks in air. It's got a density less than air. The pressure 
that an amount of vapor is under affects its volume. And the weight of that volume of vapor also affects your choice of vapor pump. So density is rather useful and important to us. Okay, so that's about it for this morning. You guys uh, have good luck on your homework, and uh, we'll be talking to you later. Take care.